Hello, and welcome to Getting to Know Your Friends. I'm your host, Zach Rowland, uh, and today we have a very, very, very special guest, uh, Kevin Mullaney. Thank you for coming. I always give my guests a little one-person applause whenever well, they get on the you. show. So That's usually thanks for coming. the number of people who applaud it at the same time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just a one single guy. One like, person. I know him. Uh, so Kevin, uh, wow, I'm, I'm just, this is great. Like I'm super excited to have you on the show and um, get to know you a lot more. Um, I've kind of gotten to know you a little bit through working with you uh, with improv, but I want to know like where you've come from and what all you've done and the fun life things that you've done. And so um, let's just start off with uh, where are you originated at? Well, actually, I was – well, I did, wasn't born in Kansas City. I was born in outside of Chicago. Okay. Lived briefly as a youngster, mm-hmm. as a toddler in uh, Kansas City. And oh, you did? Grew up uh, in a little town from like age five on. Grew up in a little town in Peoria called Morton, Illinois. Okay, Morton. See, my uh, stepfather's from Streeter. Are you familiar with Streeter? Just by name. Yeah. It's you know, that's by Pontiac, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of on the way to Chicago from yeah. where I lived. Yeah. Cool, cool. So um, so you uh, were mostly a Chicago person. I mean, you lived outside of it, but then... Well, like, yeah, pretty far out. I mean, it's three hours away, so I didn't oh, really... Okay. It, it, you know, I visited Chicago as a kid, but I, I didn't live in Chicago. I went to University of Illinois. And that's uh, in... Champaign-Urbana. Champaign Urbana, which yeah. is also it's about been two there. and a half hours away from Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that, was, that was a good time. I, I enjoyed uh, school. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, no, I, that's where, probably where things changed for me, uh, radically changed for me. Because I was... Well, when I was a kid, I was a, I was a very... I was one of those really uh, sort of, uh, I don't know what to write. I was, I was a smart kid. I, I was very good at math and science. Okay. I did like math and science competitions, you know, uh, played chess, all that kind of stuff. I wasn't, I wasn't like a, a complete geek, nerd, mm-hmm. whatever. I don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, like I played sports and other things too, but, yeah, at that, too. but I was a very, I was a very smart kid. You were, and, I think you're like well-rounded. I really think like maybe, but I like I didn't like. I mean, I I didn't study English. I was not involved in the arts. Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, okay. I mean, I I took an Eng- like I took the bare minimum English classes in, mm-hmm. in high school, and then when I went to college, I was got in on this program where it made it. I was really easy for me to get in any class I wanted because I was able to sign up for things early um, as an honor student, and uh, so that first year. At U of I, I took a filmmaking class and I took a poetry class, mm. and, along with my chemical engineering classes. <laughs> and it was probably you know midway through the first term when I hatched this plan to switch to become an English major with a cinema studies minor, and uh-huh. then I would become a great film director wow. after college. Yeah, and um, Scorsese. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem was is that the at the time the U of I had had this was twenty five years ago at the time U of I had a not didn't really have a, a program. I mean, the the cinematography program was a set of small classes uh, in the visual arts department where they had a couple sixteen millimeter cameras and mm-hmm. you know it's nothing like what I see today where where I'll I'll go I'll work with a college group on a film right and they'll have twenty people crewing and, yeah. and they'll have grips and lights and multiple camera shoots and. And everybody seems to actually know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it was nothing like that. It was like just some uh, this one guy who used to be a cinematographer who said, "Here's the camera, go figure it out." Yeah. Um. So I didn't really get much practical experience uh, in college. It was just more sort of stoking the desire. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's kind of interesting how throughout you know time uh, we've we've can kind of see that with different programs because I I mean like. You know, I'm a little bit younger, and I went to the University of Kansas, but uh, I remember, like, in the film department, there already being this um, kind of, like, art, a larger outreach to the world with the equipment that they had, with how they were filming. Like you were saying, there's 20 people on a project. Um, but knowing also that, like, sometime there were, at one time there were people going to L.A., doing a job and then going back to maybe like their hometown and teaching for that university or teaching mm-hmm. for that one 
place that they they wanted to do. Uh, and so now with the internet and everything that we have, people are so knowledgeable about that, um, and the programs have just burst open yeah. with that kind of stuff. So uh, it's almost intimidating. I feel like nowadays, I don't know. What do you, how do you like? Could you do it now? You think if you really wanted to, would you get back into it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I try to do some film projects in, here and there, but it's mm-hmm. one of those things where uh, I, like the learning curve is a bit high for me right now, and I don't have the time. Yeah. To do it, I, I wish. You know, I think it would have been a very different experience for me if at the time I had access to digital cameras mm-hmm. and Final Cut Pro when I was 20 years old. Yeah. I would have been making films every weekend, <laughs> probably every day I would yeah. have been out shooting and, and doing stuff. Um, you know, if I had the equipment I have today, I, yeah. you know, I have a, a nice Canon uh, camera that shoots for really nice HD video yep. and and I've got m- good mics and all this stuff. Like, I could, I could have... Created, but I just don't have the time or yeah. the like. I have this all this other projects I'm working on and right. all this other focus. So, uh, but I think it's yeah, it's a totally different experience being I, I, like the 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 kinds of things that people mounted mm-hmm. or are mounting today. It's still expensive, and you know these people are spending ten, twenty thousand dollars to create their thesis film from yeah. college or whatever. Uh, but in my ta- in my day, you know that yeah. was that we those budgets were like that or or more. But it was all film. Yeah. Like so, we've we've managed to eliminate the cost of film and, wow. and these projects because it's all digital. Interesting. Uh, and I think even the cameras are cheaper and stuff. You know, a Canon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you couldn't get a decent sixty millimeter camera for seven hundred dollars or whatever. Like mm-hmm. you can get a a good digital HD camera now for under a thousand dollars absolutely yeah so yeah it's a very different experience incredible so uh, all right so then you uh, then you took off from there right you went after yeah I decided to... I went to I spent a year abroad in London mm-hmm. and I started doing theater while I was there yeah uh, with a with a uh, they called it the Drama Society. It was basically a club attached to the student union. Uh-huh. It wasn't a, a program. Again, I was studying English, but then doing this drama stuff on the side. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's when I sort of caught more of the theater bug than the film bug. Yeah. And I decided after I was going to graduate from college, I was going to finish up with my English degree, and then I was going to go to Chicago, become an actor, and then go off and do my MFA somewhere as, a, <laughs> as an actor. Yeah. That was the plan. So I switched my MFA in directing film to his MFA in in, in acting, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, now it's twenty years later, and yeah, and uh, where's the no, MFA? Right? No MFA. Yeah, which I don't think I suffered very much <laughs> for from not having, but I agree. Uh, but yeah, it's very different. Turns out very differently than I thought. Yeah, I uh, I began as a, uh, a theater major in acting. Um, I was in rehearsal one day doing uh, a high school play with Rainmaker and uh, playing the adult father figure because I was the only person that could grow a beard at the time at the age sure. of 18. And Very useful. Yes, yes. College theater department. Yeah, yeah. And my uh, director stopped the rehearsal. And I, I just think this will ever be forever ingrained in my memory. She stopped the rehearsal. We were just going at it. And she looked up at me, and she's like, what are you going to college again for? And I said, technical theater. At the time, I was big into technical theater. I wanted to mm-hmm. learn lights and sound, and I was building sets, and I had looked into joining up with the uh, with the set building union. I can't remember now what they call it or whatever. Is it SAG? Or? No, that's, that's not. That's acting. That's stupid. That's sad, yeah. yeah um, you can clearly see I am nowhere near any of that. Likewise, I have no, no mm-hmm. you know... Uh, idea of what what any of that stuff really is but she looked at me and she's like don't do that go be an actor you know you're you're you may like technical stuff Boy, she but she fucked you over man. yeah right <laughs> yeah go back in she time she really and be like, did no like yeah learn something practical right no i just like god i'm like why did you tell me that so i i took off you know took off and went and studied at the university of kansas and started off in acting and my first um uh, semester there, I didn't do any acting. I didn't do uh, a single acting class. All of it was gen eds. And I thought to myself, well, if this is college, then fuck this. Like, I don't want to be a, I don't want to just do, and I wanted to act, you know, I wanted to yeah, get, yeah. I wanted to get into it. And unfortunately, I fell into the 
the relationship uh, hole and started getting more into my relationship than actually finding myself as a human being and did not lead me to London, although I wish it would have yeah. because I've always had a desire to study with these amazing people that, you know, especially in London and, and you Well, know, the great thing about the London thing was it wasn't, I mean, I don't know if it was great exactly. There, there was no program. It was... Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, there was, but the program was we have a black box uh, theater that we can do 30 shows in 30 weeks in. Mm-hmm. And who wants to direct a show? The people with the least experience, i.e. the person who has never directed before, gets top priority. Wow. So, uh, and, you know, most people could do, if they really were motivated, they could do two shows a year. But, but oh. it, was re- it was a different person every week, mm-hmm. different play. You know, and, and it just whatever what you wanted to do was fine. You know, wow. you could you could I I directed a pinter play. Uh huh. I directed the homecoming as my, the first thing, my first foray into directing, which was uh, the the homecoming. Yeah, I, yeah. I directed it in London with English actors, uh-huh. which is insane. Yeah, it's when- just insane to think that at age nineteen I knew what I was doing that I could direct, uh, and know 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 enough about a pinter pinter and. East yeah. end of London to yeah. direct this play. And for those listening, can you kind of go into Pinter and sure? And so Pinter was a uh, 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 and is a uh, writer, uh, an English writer. He started in the fifties, I believe, and uh, he's known for he, he was kind of known for this absurdist style. This very mm-hmm. uh, his plays had the veneer of being very realistic. Yeah, uh, but. They would have absurd elements and 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 sort of you know characters behaving in in what seemed like somewhat irrational ways or or flurries of of sort of expressionistic dialogue that was built into it. Mm-hmm. Very uh, intense uh, uh, plays that he wrote. Yeah. Um, and uh, and very much about East End. Not always, but. V- very often about uh, characters who are from the East End who yeah. s- spoke with a Cockney accent. <laughs> with a very... And with, and it, 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 with stuff I didn't know. I mean, for example, there was a guy in the cast. I cast a guy from New Zealand as one of the one of the brothers mm-hmm. in, in The Homecoming, the brother who's a boxer. I think his name is Joey. And... Um, uh, I thought he was doing great in rehearsal. I, I mean, I, he was. He was acting well. I, yeah. you know, I, I didn't have a problem with his performance at all. And one of the English actors came up to me and said, "Are we going to do anything about his accent?" And I'm, <laughs> like, I'm like, "What do you What do you mean?" It's like he's he's got a New Zealand accent. He doesn't sound English at all. And to my ear, it was yeah. like, you know, my 19 year old ear, I couldn't. I didn't bother me. I don't know. I'm sure I could tell, but it sure. just didn't bother me. Like I don't. That seems fine to me, and I was like, "Okay, you work with him," and and he worked with him, and it, I'm sure it was a terrible, ac- accent wise, yeah. but it was one of those things. And it didn't matter to me, but I'm doing huh. this in London with English actors, and they're really into, yeah, like they want. And anybody it's... anybody who would see it would they, any English student who would see it would be like, "What is going on with that guy's accent? Like, <laughs> nothing, why is the the younger brother from New Zealand in this play?" And yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's <clears throat> funny. I got cast as a, I don't know, did like a thing, an accent once in a cat, in a, I can't even remember. It was a ten minute play. I always felt like I was doing it wrong, and somebody was gonna hear it and go, "That's not the right accent, buddy." I hate working with accents. Ugh, oh, I, hate I did, it. yeah, and I, I, I knew I wasn't fit for the part necessarily, but I have a friend of mine was directing it, and he's like, "Well, you're funny." So I'd like to see you put some humor into this role because we've had nobody come in and audition. Yeah, he called me into audition, and you know he's like, "Yeah, I like it. Let's do it." And I looked nothing, nothing like what I thought the part would be like. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's all. So you were nineteen. You're already directing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Because I also but that was the thing. I direct stuff. that that year. I directed. I did lighting design. I did. Uh, I produced a show that went to Edinburgh. Oh yeah, um, Edinburgh oh, Fringe Fest, right? The Edinburgh Fringe Fest. Yeah. So I've been to Edinburgh. Festival maybe let's see one two three four times. Oh, that's so great! <coughs> I would love I would just love to go over there and experience. I've heard so many amazing things about the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It's fun. Um, it's a lot. It's a it's it's like it's boot camp for the entertainment industry because mm-hmm. you um, you know you go and uh, you have a show and and you have to figure out how to get people to see your show. You have to figure out how to get the press to see your show. Mm-hmm. And it's just this pressure cooker for three three weeks, and the stakes, 
you know, I mean, there's not like a huge number of people who, who launch their careers from it, but you can certainly um, build something quite uh, nice in, in Edinburgh. The, like, uh, uh, to use an example, Baby Wants Candy. Mm-hmm. Went, my third year, I went as sort of uh, along. I wasn't in Baby Wants Candy, but I was sort of consulting. I was like a consulting producer or something. Oh, yeah. Like hanging out with them and telling them my experience and how what we had to do to get people to come see us shows and stuff. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and Baby Wants Candy, I'm sorry, is a group from Chicago. They're an improv group from Chicago who does do. improvised musicals. They're yes. Currently in New York, in yeah. Chicago, and in L.A. Yeah. And back then they were just a, a team at I.O. At, in Chicago. And uh, so they they did really well that first year. After a few nights they were selling out in a maybe 100-seat theater. Mm-hmm. And so it became this thing where, you know, they paid. Uh, it became a thing where... I don't think the people who go over and do that show, they, they've gone like six or seven times now, maybe more. I don't think the people who do that show make a lot of money. They, they probably don't make hardly anything. But yeah. they get three weeks in Edinburgh, all expenses paid. Uh, um, they have a great time. They perform with uh, – they usually recruit a uh, Scottish uh, uh, rock cover band uh-huh. to, to be the, the, the group the, the, to provide the music. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. So, and there's definitely a, a, a host of, of success stories where people go and, and parlay it somehow into a career. There's a guy, Rich Fulcher, who's a fairly well known comic in England. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's an American, he's from Chicago. And his first trip to uh, Britain was at the, the Fringe Festival with an improv show. Mm-hmm. And that show did so well that. Go ahead, yeah. No. <laughs> Allergies, guys. Uh, they're terrible. Yeah. It's that time of year, too, when spring and summer, and they all meet together. And... <laughs> it's right in the middle of my Fulcher story. So, uh, the Fulcher story. Yeah, Fulcher yeah. Uh, is part of a group a show called Modern Problems in Science. Mm-hmm. It became sort of a hit at Edinburgh, and he parlayed that. <laughs> he parlayed that into uh, a stand-up career in, in England, and he was... He's been on a number of television shows there, yeah. and he's re- he's well known there. Yeah, even though he's 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 only he's only sort of um, not quite as famous in in the U.S. But right, I almost feel like it's I don't know with the whole U.S. situation. I mean, I'm 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 not even in a tier of that at all. But looking at the levels of fame and stardom and success and what you want to consider it, it, it does seem like it's different and in other places than America. Like in America, it's very, I don't know, There's, it's still like an American dream. You know, like you do this thing, which leads to this thing, which leads to this thing, it means you're famous. And, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, but that's not necessarily, I feel like how it is anywhere else. Uh, and maybe I'm just disillusioned to it because I haven't been outside of the United States, but how was that, I mean, is that kind of how that felt over there? Or is it more like, because I feel like it's more or less I know, the I think craft that, there. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that they, it, it's probably changed a bit, but you know the for years and years, most of the acting training or or a lot of the very best acting training in the United States took place outside of universities. Mm. You know, it took place at the at the uh, the neighborhood playhouse in New York yeah. and the um, oh shoot, what's his name the the Method Strasberg Studio. Yeah, um, and the theater they came from. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so so there were, there's been this tradition of of kind of outsider schools uh, that you know sometimes would become accredited and, and, and affiliated with colleges, but often were just a guy teaching in a studio or a woman teaching in a studio somewhere. Um, that is not the case uh, in England. It was always these very uh, these conservatory programs that were uh-huh. much more like going to college. And the the upshot of that in part was that you really couldn't get acting jobs in England very mm-hmm. much unless you'd gone through one of the, the major conservatories. That was oh. my impression at least. Um, whereas in, in in America you just show up for the audition. And yeah. so there's this there's this um, in general the American actor is viewed as, as having fewer skills in general and Yeah, and, I can and, see that. And uh, not as well trained. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of really well-trained actors in America, but mm-hmm. but like you know, you can go to a, a, a an audition and there's somebody from Juilliard and there's somebody uh, from Yale and there's somebody who just took 
you know an eight week class at the uh, at the acting garage in in Toledo. You know, so, yeah. And the guy from the acting garage in Toledo might get the part because he looks like it, right? You know, that's yeah. that's how the part looks. You know, yeah. That that was less so in, in England. The other thing was was you got the sense there were a lot of actors who made a living, made a comfortable living, but there were fewer the the sort of superstar mentality of of Hollywood. Right. You know, there weren't there weren't people making. There were very few English actors that came close to making millions and millions of dollars <laughs> unless they moved to Hollywood sure. you know the, the, the actors and they could get a deal they get yeah they could yeah. get that if they got themselves in Hollywood movies but um, so it was much more sort of like a, a you know career uh, not not a uh, not a quest for fame kind of thing I get you know yeah, similar to like how I'm sure there's check. Broadway actors and plenty of t- television actors in the United States who reach that level of yeah they're making a good living, but uh, but it's they're they're not they're not really that famous. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're not uh, they're not they're certainly not paid extreme amounts of money. Right. Yeah. The starving artist thing really does. <laughs> but that changes. I think that that changes the the pursuit of it. You know, you have if if there isn't a when there is a level of there are there are a limited number of people who are going to be making you know who might make. Fifty million dollars on a mm-hmm. on one movie, then you're going to have uh, lots of more people who sort of want to do it just for that reason to right. be super famous and to be super rich. Whereas mm-hmm. you don't. That's not why you get into acting. I think in England you don't become an actor to become super rich and super famous yes. because you don't. There's no. That yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah, as yeah. much. You know? Yeah, I, yeah. I think that that speaks leagues of the talent. And the training and the professionalism. Yeah. Well, and also just the size. I mean, the size of the yeah. industry there is, is different. And, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. So you were there for a year then. Yeah, and so I know all about it because yeah. I was there for a year when yeah. I was nineteen, and so sure. therefore yeah, I you know lived it. Yeah. So what was next? Uh, then I moved to Chicago. Well, I went actually went back after college for another six months. Mm-hmm. Then I moved to Chicago, started doing improv, started doing acting. Yeah. Well, after a couple of years, got involved at IO. Okay. Um, what, 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 you took, what took you from that? You said you, because you went to directing, and then you and then you went. To well, the, I was acting in college, and and it, that was really by the time I left college, I wanted to be an actor. Yeah, and that was my first choice. Was I wanted to be an actor, probably on the stage, maybe on film, mm-hmm. and um, so I moved to Chicago, and 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 and, and meet like I, I looked, you know, where are the cities to go to if you want to be if you want to learn how to become an actor? Right. And Chicago's near the top of that list. Yeah. Um, so, and it was the closest place, and mm-hmm. New York seemed super scary to me. Not super scary, but super super unpleasant to yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was, was a just, time. Well, and also I had visited New York, but I hadn't really visited. The neighborhoods where people really live in New York. Yeah, you know, I sort of one the the one time I had visited, it was like the financial district and Times Square. <laughs> and if you, that's the two places you see in New York, it's like, why would you ever live here? This is horrible. Yes, this is also Times Square in 1989, not Times Square and completely different, which is very different. It's oh like, my gosh, yeah, Before so pre Giuliani, yeah, or the uh, yeah. near the beginning of his 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 reign. Yes, but. Uh, so I didn't, yeah, I didn't like what I saw in New York, and uh, I didn't think L.A. would be a place I'd want to go. Mm-hmm. I th- thought of other places like San Francisco and Seattle are supposed to be good places. Minneapolis is supposed to be a good place mm-hmm. uh, for theater, um, but it just seemed like Chicago was a good choice. Cool. So I went there, started studying acting. Yeah. Started taking improv classes because everybody takes improv classes in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, the mecca. And then just got sucked slowly, got sucked more into that than into. I think it was more. It wasn't so much that I liked it more. It was that there were more. You know, it was harder to get opportunities to act mm-hmm. than it was to get in, to do improv. Yeah. And and I and so I was getting a lot of it uh, opportunities to improvise mm-hmm. and was getting better faster at that than I was at acting in general. You're right. Yeah. So I just ended up an improviser more than an actor. Awesome. Yeah. No, at the same time, I also know, or at least throughout like the sprinkled history, you also led another life. You, you led an online 
life, right? As soon as the uh, the the whole concept of second life came. Uh, to well, fruition. I talked a little bit about this. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't talk a lot about this because it's kind of like this weird alter. Sure. I think what's interesting and fun about Second Life is unlike uh, Facebook or Twitter or especially in the Facebook age, uh, it, it harkens back to a time in the internet where you could become a persona and exactly. be that persona. And I really, I liked that internet mm-hmm. a lot better. I liked the internet where you were a different, you know, you, you could be on 20 different websites and there was no interaction between them. You were, you were one, you were, you could be, uh, it's sort of like, you know, people will talk about this like, uh, if you're into some sort of geeky subculture, like uh-huh. you're into comic, you know, some comic books or yeah. computer programming or or something that might have a com- online community, right? You know, you could join that online community as a 13 year old and be treated as an equal with 40 year olds, mm-hmm. uh, and not because they don't know, they don't know, they don't know your gender unless you tell them, they don't yep. know your your age unless you tell them, yep. and, and you know, most people honest. most people don't ask and yeah. most people don't care, yeah. And so, and that was true in Second Life too, where it was just this place where you can you can just be whatever you want to be. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was it, it was a I have participated in various MMOs over the years, uh-huh. uh, go, going back to college in pre-internet MMOs, essentially on uh, the college uh, uh, computer per- system at U of I. Uh-huh. Um, and I've always been interested in them, and and, uh, and I had spent a few years playing World of Warcraft and wanted to stop playing World of Warcraft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so rather Recovery. than... Recovery. Well, I knew <laughs> that my, the way I work is get, the way to break an addiction is to replace it with another one. Sure. So uh, I started true. looking around for something else to do, mm-hmm. and Second Life was... Um, the nice thing about Second Life was instead of doing a bunch of mindless quests... Or, mm-hmm. You know that you actually could go in there and learn things. You could learn programming. You could learn, uh, you know, you oh, could yeah. sharpen your skills as in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. And and if you made something worthwhile, you get paid for it. Yeah. So I was I wasn't really going in there to make a living or anything. I was just a curiosity for me. But I ended up creating some uh, scripted devices mm-hmm. that became pretty good sellers and I lived off of that income for three or four years from wow. from selling things in Second Life. Yeah, that's cool. I, yeah, I think I love that the whole idea of having an, uh, another persona um, and and kind of yeah having it be more anonymous you know like uh, not having to worry so much about the judgment of people that you interact with daily or any of that it's like you get to you get to live that other Well life. yeah, there's no like if yeah anyone who for the most part, you you left people's personal lives to themselves, mm-hmm. and you got to know them. I the, I felt like you actually got to know people in a very intimate way. Yeah, uh, at least some people. I I made a few friends that I got to know very very well. Mm-hmm. And you know, I would be I would be in Second Life working ten twelve hours a day sometimes. Oh wow! And and they would be as well, and we would be chatting off and on that yeah. entire time it's sort of like it's a lot like having a texting relationship with yeah. somebody but it was even more intense you know I, I realized there were people who in four or five weeks I got I spent more time with uh, than maybe people I'd known for years yeah that's crazy uh, so I mean, you, it's you, funny you, yeah you got yeah. to know them really well without knowing their name or knowing really where they lived or how their age or, uh-huh. or their gender or whatever yeah. you know yeah but you like them, and you, and you, are, and, and mm-hmm. you work with them, or you do those things. And, and there would just... be people from totally different, you know, you get to know people from other countries, yeah. and, or so they said. Um, <laughs> it's sort you of, it's funny to me, like, this whole catfishing thing. Yes. Because, like, Second Life is is a catfish bonanza, yep. you know what I mean, essentially. Yeah, anybody but, can be anybody. Anybody can be anybody. But, but I think anybody who's spent enough time in there starts to realize, like, oh, I don't care anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care who you say you are. Yeah. The, uh, or I don't care who you are in real life. It, I don't, I'm never going to meet you in real life. I don't <laughs> need to ever see a picture of you. Right. We, we, have an, we have a connection, you know, that's purely intellectual and purely about... Uh, keys on a on a keyboard, and I don't care about anything else about you. So it's yeah. sort of like, I, I I guess I would I would never, 
I would be so skeptical of any like if if there was anybody I wanted to meet in real life like yeah. through a, a, a website or whatever that I met online. Mm-hmm. I guess I would never be shocked that they would not be who they were, and I'd yeah. never be like, "How dare you be ten twenty pounds heavier than you than I thought you were based right. on your photo?" Because it was just like. Because people would represent themselves as completely other people. Yeah, or maybe other, even like other colors, right? Yeah, be, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like people were totally, you know, like yeah, white people pretending to be black people and vice versa. Yeah. And well, then they have like blue people on there. Wasn't there kind of like a? Well, sure, yeah. And half the people were dressed as as uh, you know, uh, f- uh, like come half uh, fox, half pe- right. person, and. You know, there's a furry thing that, that was yeah. happening. Now there were people who would go around dressed as dragons the whole time. Yeah, you know, sort of like wow. well, like how could I be angry at you? Like you're you're not a dragon in real life, right? You know? <laughs> how dare you for falsifying who you? You know, or you're not a you're a, you're not a member of Starfleet or whatever else. It was all wow. role playing. You know, yeah. People were deciding who they wanted to be and yeah, exploring that. So yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah, I like that. I like that, you know, you have, like, that hobby. Um, you know, you moved on from one, like I said, move on from one hobby to another hobby or one habit to another habit. Um, and, yeah, that's, like, that moment where you find the next fun thing in your life and you work with that. And I felt that was that was a one, a, a healthy one, a one where I learned things. And Yeah, definitely. So, um, so then, uh, and just to jump ship off of that, then also I know that you're a poker player, and you've done some. <coughs> some good, oh, bless you! Sorry. Yeah, very good. Um, you've done some hardcore poker playing, and sure, yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, what was that experience like? Well, I, I played as a kid. You know, played crazy, strange games as a kid. And yeah, this was. Oh, sorry. This yeah, is this nice. was uh, years before the poker boom in in the U.S. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, we would. Uh, I guess it, yeah, I played you know poker as a kid, like a lot of people do. And then when I was an adult, actually, it was when I moved to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I had found out from my sisters that my father was playing a lot of casino poker yeah. at the time. This was Limit Hold'em. He was playing. <laughs> And he came to visit me, and I think my sisters were worried about him gambling his life savings away. My grandfather's doing the same exact and, thing right now. And so I talked to him about it. I asked him about it, and he decided that he was going to take me to a casino. Mm-hmm. And I find out years later his whole, his agenda was he was going to take me to a casino, give me 100 bucks, let me play poker, let me lose, and then I would never want to play poker again in the casino. Oh. That's similar to it, how the it, smoking story goes. You know, like they, if you catch, you know, they catch you smoking, they make you smoke all those cigarettes, so they make you sick. Yeah, interesting. So it backfired. <sighs> it gave me a, it gave me a hundred, two hundred dollars to play with, something like that, <clears throat> and I won money the first day. Mm-hmm. Then we went to another casino the next day. I won money the second day, mm-hmm. and so I was convinced that I had some natural ability at poker, yeah. which was it was basically just I listened well to his advice. He. He coached me, told me the basic strategy. Oh, cool! Uh, you know uh, that he followed. Yeah, and I just Do you, you know I got that? lucky, and it's just conservative. It's like you you play you do, you only play good cards, and excuse me, you only continue if if you've if your cards fit with what's going on on the on the board. Yeah, I mean, it's very. It wasn't very complicated what he explained to me. Sure, but it um, worked. Yeah, and it was a lot of luck. I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter what your strategy is. If you play long enough, you'll have streaks where you win. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, so I went home, and I, I, I found, uh, you know, back then, I can't remember what the site was. It was Paradise Poker, I think. Yeah, was, it was the I first site I played on. Mm-hmm. I played on Paradise Poker. I played... I think I played uh, on Paradise as well. Uh, some other thing uh, you know this other place where you could play poker for uh, with for just play money mm-hmm. we went to uh, met some friends in Las Vegas played poker there yeah. I got really serious for a while and I, I read a lot of books and mm-hmm. I was probably four or five months into it and started sort of calculating how much money I was making because I was making money oh yeah and it, but it came out to like I'm making two dollars an hour. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I, I'm not going to continue doing this, making yeah. two dollars an hour. So yeah. I gave it up, 
and then years later it came up again and I was playing with friends and mm-hmm. starting to go to casinos and then uh, around the time that I was getting involved in Second Life I was also playing online very seriously oh yeah and for a period I was doing much better I was making like four dollars an hour no I mean I was making <laughs> the, there were a few months before I left New York where I was making three or four thousand a month oh wow which uh, you know that's livable if you could consistently make that absolutely Especially if you could live wherever the hell you wanted. You right, know? right. So I went out to Phoenix with my dad, and we spent the we spent the winter in Phoenix mm-hmm. in Scottsdale, going to the same casino every day and playing uh, poker every mm-hmm. day in those casinos with the with the retirees and yeah and real estate dudes who play poker in in, in those huh. casinos every day. Uh, so I did that for like six months, thinking I was going to be a pro poker player. Right, and. Uh, and it, it turned out to be far more boring than <laughs> than uh, I anticipated. In what way? Playing good poker is boring because mm-hmm. what it means is ninety uh, percent of hands you fold right away. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe eighty percent of hands you fold right away. Yeah. Um, most of the hands that you do play play out in very routine ways. Um, and you may play one or two hands a day that really require creative strategy. Mm. You are you are basically looking for very predictable patterns in your in your other players, yeah. and and exploiting those patterns and yeah. playing in a very consistent not very consistent but you know how you you're supposed to play and you mm-hmm. you just sort of play that out and it's yeah. it's 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 like kind of like becoming a robot in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, now I'm sure at the higher levels, especially in tournament play, and at the higher levels, you know, really great poker players, it is a creative, interesting process mm-hmm. for them. Um, it would have to be. Yeah. Um, but for where I was at, the sort of level I was at, I wasn't that good that I could creatively, you know, come yeah. up with. Stri- Every once in a while, it would happen where I would realize how someone was playing and realize, oh, he's doing this, which means. If I do this, then I can take his money. Um, right. Check or chess. Like you were saying you you, you, know, you, you were, were getting under, yeah. you were getting one or two moves ahead of somebody. You realize there was like yeah. there was one hand where uh, there was a very aggressive guy playing with me, and he was playing after you know he was the guy after me. Mm-hmm. So I, he would always get to act right after me. And there was this we were the next to last card of a of a particular hand, mm-hmm. and he bet. Uh, or I bet, and he raised me, and I and I really didn't want to call his raise because mm-hmm. I didn't have a great hand. But I thought it through, and I was like, I have to call him. And then I then I thought, you know, if I call him now, I have to call whatever he bets on the river. I can't fold. I'm I'm stuck with the hand. So I spent like five minutes deciding whether or not to call. I call. The next card comes up. I check automatically. He bets automatically, and oh. I call immediately. Yeah. And it freaked him out. It, like, because he didn't. He was like, "What? Why did you call me so fast?" Because I had thought about the like previous. That. I had thought about the previous move for like three or four minutes. Yes. And then the next move, I just I had already thought through the next move. Yeah. Like he's gonna bet no matter what. Yeah. So I gotta call no matter what. No uh-huh. matter what card hits on the river, I have to call. Yep. And and so he thought the whole thing was a setup. You know, he I thought he it. thought that I had totally fucked with him. Yes. And when he was just being kind of an aggressive, I just clued in the fact that he was being an aggressive player and yep. and I just had to call him. Yeah. And uh, so that was so every once in a while you would have these sort of insights where with a particular player it's like oh when he does this it means it all it almost always means you know he does x it almost always means y and right. therefore I can make money off this situation I should try and find this situation to make money off of him. Huh. The other thing though which that brings up which I didn't like in the long run was it turned you into a predatory kind of Mindset. I see that. You know, you would go into the casino and you would see, oh my God, look at that guy playing in, in on table seven. I've played with him before. He's really bad. I love playing with him. Oh. And and that's it's very different than sort of going in and going like, where can I find the most competitive game? Like if you were playing, you know, there would be games like if you were a Scrabble player or something. You know, you yeah. you kind of want to play against the best people you could. But right. You don't want to just find somebody to beat. It's a challenge. You know, and that's true of most games. With, yeah. In poker, it's like, no, you want to find the richest, stupidest players to play with and exploit them. Yep. And that's 
not a pleasant mindset to live in, you know? No. It's, it's a very different mindset than being an improviser where it's like, I want to find the most talented and uh, friendly people mm-hmm. to challenge me creatively and to create things with. Right. I mean, that's an exciting mindset to live in. Yes. Uh, as a poker player, you know, I had much more fun playing my the these five and ten dollar tournaments that we would play oh, yeah. at the UCB office after after classes were done uh, on mm-hmm. Tuesday nights because you know, the games just well I mean we were took them extremely seriously but sure. the money that was at stake wasn't that big a deal That's, I mean yeah. people you would lose ten dollars or five dollars that's how my friends and I are we do that and, same thing and that was fun because yeah. it was like you were really trying to beat people and you were and you wanted people to be good and we would berate people. You know, in a way that you would never in a casino, because yep. we wanted them to be better players, so that yeah. we, so that it wasn't so easy to beat them. Yes. Um, so it sounds exactly like my every Sunday night. Right. Every Sunday night, we do the same exact that, thing. That style of poker is really is really uh, enjoyable to me. Yeah. But the kind of poker where you're grinding it out to try and make as much money is just not as not as uh, enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I've. I've uh, I've been into cards and poker for such a long time, and never have I ever tried to make any money off of it. I've always enjoyed uh, just having fun with it and trying to learn it and having it challenge me. Because um, I, I never thought I was lucky enough, or I had like the right skill set to mm-hmm. do it. Um, but uh, and I, I, it's kind of funny too because I'm risky. I'm one of those people that take risks all the time, and uh, you know, like I'll do that same thing where I'll call somebody immediately, and they're and they're like, well, and usually this is where I get called out, uh, and they're like, well, you don't, you know, you have anything depending on if it's you know the turn of the river. Usually about the turn of the river, that's when the serious action starts to happen, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, and, and then I'm kind of like, well, how can I mess with this? I like to slow play. You ever do the slow play? Sure. Yeah. 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 And you sit there and you just let them simmer and you kind of just play. Along. I used to call that. Uh, I used to call that hurting hurting the bunnies. Hurting before the bunnies. I, before I knew what really much about poker strategy, uh-huh. it would be uh, when I was playing like stupid games before we learned how to play hold'em. Yeah, it would be. That's how I thought of it. You're sort of like, okay, I've got a monster hand. Huh. I probably there's probably no way I can lose this hand, so yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna raise, but I'm only gonna raise like small amounts. To just keep the betting going, just to build the pot. Yeah, and I would call that hurting the bunnies. Which yeah, is, it's a form of slow play. It's a, it's a very bad form of slow play mm. uh, in in hold'em. Yeah, you know you don't want to just make these little raises and stuff. You want to <laughs> you because it's, it's it comes back to bite you. Yeah, yeah. very often. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I, there were definitely things where you would enjoy. I I enjoyed the moment. I realized why what the sort of mathematical foundation between raising with flush draws uh-huh. uh, and when it was made sense and when it did not. Yeah. And it was so fun to realize like, okay, this is the right, this play that looks like I've got a set of threes yeah. is the same play that I would make if I've got a flush draw uh-huh. on, the, on, the, on the flop. And that now I can do both. I can do this play where I'm behind, but I have a very good chance of beating you yeah. with is looks exactly the same as I have you clobbered and you have virtually no chance of beating me so that when I when I bet aggressively in that situation you have to decide does he is he got me clobbered or am I ahead but he's got a good chance of beating me yeah and neither of those situations feel very comfortable for you no but you know it, I used to be the guy faced with that decision you know why is this guy raising with a flush draw why is this guy raising with a straight draw yeah 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 uh, what what that seems like such a bad idea, and then I and then when you work out the math of it, it's like well if I fold half the time from that raise, mm-hmm. then you know sure then that, then you're on the other end of that uh, that uh, the whole game really where you you're you're looking for those bunnies or whatever, and then it's like you give that and I used to call it like a tell I guess or are you wherever you know people can see what you're when you're giving up or you're changing whatever your strategy is right. Um, and so I look for that too. Um, yeah, there was a whole the whole idea of it was trying to figure out ways that your what what you're doing could mean two very different things. Right. Instead of and you know you could be checking because you have a monster hand. You could be checking because you desperately want to get a free card and not and and you're hoping the person behind you won't bet. Yeah. You could be raising 
early on because you could be check raising because you have aces you could be check raising because you have ace king you could mm -hmm. be check raising because you have a pair of sevens mm -hmm. you know th this is and you don't believe the other the other person is you know you or you're just check raising with nothing right because the guy behind you has been raising so much and you want him to be afraid of you and stop raising you right uh so it, it is it's it's a fascinating thing but but only in small amounts when you're right. doing it for eight hours a day it becomes Ooh, very boring i can only imagine um some similar to improv too i think sometimes when you're doing improv for i you know all day long it's like anything you do as much as you love it if you do it for long enough you'll begin to no. have little things no. No? no never computer coding i can do for 12 hours a day oh wow not, that was what i was doing with second life and i, yeah. and I i'm doing it now with our website for the theater company I'm, I'm running which is under the gun under the gun theater yeah, which I Chicago. started last year with my uh, partner uh, Angie McMahon yeah and how's that been going we're, I, I hate to say it we're almost out of time because this is wow so I feel like we just started um, but let, I want to talk about that real quick because I think that's really great that you're doing out there doing that so how's it going so far it's going fine We've, we, we basically had four productions this year mm -hmm. Uh, a variety show that ran for ten months, a uh, an improv tournament called the uh, Under the Gun Improv Classic, which mm -hmm. we're going to do again this year, and uh, a, a show called One Act Roulette, where we wrote one act plays based mm -hmm. on improvisations, and then finally Snub Fest, which is a sh uh, a festival that uh, Angie has run for years and years, a mm -hmm. festival for stand up and storytelling and mm -hmm. solo sketch and all this other stuff. I love that, and. Um, so it's 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 been doing all right, you know. We've had Good. we've been doing classes and so forth, and we're looking to expand in this coming fall. Yeah. And so I've been working for the last month and a half every day, revamping the website to do all these things sort of automatically, like yeah. uh, make it much easier for people to register for classes or mm -hmm. buy tickets for a show or um, make it much easier for us to check them in when they get to the show. Yeah. All this kind of building building a whole website system from scratch Absolutely. which is insane yeah uh Whew, i know nothing about that like <laughs> that is the furthest away from anything i, I know nothing about coding or htt what is it H html uh, that's the one i don't know i don't know any that's of like that. the easiest that's like word perfect <laughs> yep don't know any of that yeah, uh, word, html is is easy peasy yeah i i was never i don't know i never got into computers or that side of it like i i like to play video games but i never even like i never had the desire to even want to create video games or test video you know how you some at some point in your life you're like all i want to do is sit and play video games all day and it's like nah, i get bored yeah i'm too i don't know ADD, well i think there's I a lot there's a big difference between making video games and and playing them sure well, and yeah. whenever i have had the chance to sort of get on the other other side of that mm -hmm. where i'm creating something inside of a uh, you know, using a computer yeah it's been much more um absorbing than yeah than uh than simply playing a game right right although yeah. i get totally absorbed by that as well so, <laughs> yeah. way too many hours yeah. grinding up characters in warcraft or suck right in yeah yeah Cool. Well, um, we are pretty much to the end now, and I'm super sad because I know there is a plethora of information and stories and things. I mean, we didn't even tap into a lot of the improv stuff, but that's okay because I think that you that's know that's been covered I, in a lot of other. Places. I, exactly. <laughs> like I, I know that people can find that about you anywhere, and I love talking to you about real life stuff and things like that that are interesting because I find it fascinating to get to know people in uh, that regard so thank you very much thank um, you. the last thing that I always do is I always flip the script on it a little bit and uh, offer out any like questions if you want to ask me a question or two or anything um, I know that seems you know like kind of like a weird way to be like all right there we go well so you work as a you work in a kitchen I do and did you is that something you went to school with or is it something you just sort of worked your way up through a kitchen yep I picked it up along the way uh, Boy Scouts is actually where I I learned to. I, I taught myself how to cook. Okay. My very first experience cooking, I uh, I burnt macaroni and cheese, uh -huh. and from that point on, I I vowed to never make another bad meal again. <laughs> that is not a vow I've kept, but uh, it is something that I found very true because I was I uh, had to become self reliant very early on. My mother wasn't there; uh, she had to work, uh, so she wasn't there to like take care of me necessarily. And my stepfather had odd hours. He worked at a, um, a, a 
a car factory mm-hmm. plant, whatever Ford or no, he works for Ford now. He was working for uh, Dupont at the time. So weird hours, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and so I had to become really self reliant, and I just kind of started teaching myself how to do these things. But I wanted to make them better each time. So and if yeah. you were uh, creating a meal to impress a, a, a lady, uh-huh. uh huh, like what would be your go to? Like okay, I got this. Will be oh, this will be the. I hate to say it, but... You gotta reveal. Italian? Like sure, if I, of course. Oh, I don't know. People just have this thing for Italian food, uh-huh. and I am all about spices, uh, especially anything that's got Italian spices with, like, uh, like thyme, and uh, uh, there's, uh, like, uh, basil. Oh, I love basil. Um, what else? Parsley. I mean, all of those green spices. Of course, garlic. Garlic is, like, my jam. I mean, that stuff is... Oof. Uh, I put it in everything. Sure. Um, so you... Stuffer yeah. full of garlic. Stuffer full of garlic, which is probably <laughs> not the uh, the most uh, efficient way or best way of impressing a woman and being like, all right, well, here's all this garlic now. Let's, uh, you know, da da da. Um, but no, I think I, I love to, to make a, a nice red sauce. Um, and I don't use like spaghetti, I, I use like a penne or something like that. Just a little bit different. Um, I don't know. Yeah, there's always. And I like working with oils as well. Any kind of like oil, olive oil, canola oil things of that nature so garlic bread i mean carbs carbs is the way to anyone's heart i feel like that's you know you can't go wrong it's it's just not possible uh even like this morning uh you know watching my friends eat bagels and it's just like carb (laughs) overload and i'm like okay yeah carbs is the way so yeah definitely i've made many italian meal and one over many american girl (laughs) There you go. But I cook burgers on the on the regular. Sure. So well, that's a staple uh, of manhood. Yeah. Yeah. Just meat, meat and potatoes. Um, but not a lot of women like that meat and potatoes. There's a romance to it. If I could cook more French, I know that sounds really weird to say cook more French, but like if I could like incorporate their <coughs> uh, sense of. Uh, of Flair and like panage with the food that they that they serve and have. I think I would I would have a whole another facet and um, and that's even something with like if you take French but also look into like Creole and Cajun uh, and the, those kind of and that's like you're getting spicy. You're getting into the the you know crawdads and and jambalayas and which I have not dabbled with, but <coughs> I'm curious because there's just so much again spice that goes along with all that. And I'm big into Mediterranean. I like curry. I like cumin. Um, I'm real, yeah, I'm all over the world with my uh, eating habits and cooking habits. So, yeah, kind of just my that's my that's my fun little hobby. It's like that thing like I could probably cook all day long because I do cook all day long, but then I still go home and cook more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that thing. That's me coding cooking. That's your coding. <laughs> that's my coding. It's cooking. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's it. I think we got uh, what we needed, and I know that I would love to sit here and talk to you all day and ask you way more questions, but we've got regular non-second lives lives to live, <laughs> not first life lives to I have live. To get out of this apartment that I'm apparently allergic to. I know. I'm so sorry. Your allergies are terrible. So, yeah. um, but thank you again very much. Um, this it's been uh, wonderful uh, hanging out with you and, and getting to know you and. I know that we'll continue to, you know, build the friendship and, um, and of course, you know, be able to work together and everything. So uh, I wish you the best of luck and with everything in Chicago. That's so okay. great. I love that there's so many more uh, opportunities now for people to go to different places other than just like the staples. You know, like branch out, live a little. So awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Zach. Thanks. <laughs>